for 23 years, I lived as an atheist. Like, I didn't believe in God at all. At all. In fact, I used to love it when missionaries or Christians or something would come up to my door and try to speak to me about God because I used to look forward to arguing with them to prove them wrong. It wasn't until my sister was diagnosed uh, with cancer that <clears throat> things got even worse for me. And it was about this time that things got so bad that I almost lost my fiance. And I remember sitting on the couch late at night and just thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna change? And so I sent a message to my friend Ryan and this was like gosh this had to have been probably one o'clock in the morning I was like you've got to be straight up with me man like what what do I need to do what what do I do what do I do and he just said and mind you he had no idea I was an atheist like we had known each other for a while he became good friends um, but he didn't know that I was an atheist because I just I never talked about that you know I, I liked Ryan a lot and uh, <clears throat> I knew he was a Christian so I just kind of kept that part of me at bay um, he's like you need to just you know you you need to let Jesus into your life my mom's very very um, devout the most beautiful mom I could ever, ever have. Ever and ever. She's like, I knew that someday things would change for you. Like, all I have ever wanted was for you to know that your Heavenly Father loves you. She says, you know, I've prayed for you so many times. And I just knew that someday God would find you and he would help you. Man, he did. But man, it doesn't matter what your background is, what you've done, everything can change if you just give yourself. If you just give yourself to God, everything can change. Thank you to my wife for, never, for not giving up on me and my family and my friends. But most of all, thank you, Jesus, like, for everything. I was born into a Muslim family. Um, my parents were leaders in the mosque and I met these two Christians at my grad school. We just realized, okay, we definitely are both very strong in our faiths, but we can't both be right. We can both be wrong, like logically in my mind, it's like, okay, we can both be wrong about Jesus for sure, but we can't both be right. So we sort of resolved that we wanted to figure out what truth is. And secretly, secretly, I wanted to convert him massively. I totally wanted to convert him to Islam. He gave me a Bible, I gave him a Quran, and we started to just sort of do our own research. And I would come with my bullet points and he would come with his.
He had been praying for me all along, and his church actually had been praying too down south. And he, his pastor actually had brought um, or had typed up bullet points from the book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. I was like, I'll read anything. Why not? It gave so much significant proof for the historicity of the cross and resurrection. And I started to read the Bible again. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. And then I called somebody that I knew who was a Christian. She said, why don't you just ask Jesus to come into your heart? I don't know what's real. Whoever you are though, I want to give my life to you. If you're Jesus, you can come into my heart. The next morning I woke up and all the torment was gone. So I thought to myself, okay, logic brain, I'll just, I'm gonna really give this exploration of the gospels three or four years of my life and I'm gonna really like look into it to see if it's real. I'm gonna stay a Muslim, of course. I would never leave Islam, but I just wanna give this a chance. And so I just basically went to church that Sunday and some signs had happened that week all pointing to Jesus. And that Sunday morning, the pastor was preaching and then I just kind of sat through it, but my heart just wanted to worship. And when the altar call came, we all bowed our heads and the pastor just said, I feel like there's someone in here that wants to give their life to Jesus, but they don't even know what that means and they're really scared. And I just said, enough is enough. He's my first experience with love. All 57 members of that team laid an orange rose at the feet of their fellow student. That's Ashley Adametz. She was diagnosed with leukemia last month. The video of this gesture has gone viral, as it should, and she took to Twitter after saying uh, the game that she was, quote, shocked, overwhelmed, and speechless. Really sweet video. It's very sweet, and you know what's nice about it? It's a nice thing for the guys to do. It's gentlemanly and proper. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> Can you hear my voice coming through both sides? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. It's beeping. So now technically your device is on. <laughs> Can you tell? exciting. Here you can put it down for a second. Just get used to the sound. <laughs> what does it sound like? Yes, is a hard-working third grade teacher who just won $150,000, but what she did with that money got her an invitation to my show from Boston, Massachusetts. Please welcome the amazing Nicole Ballerman. Well, you're just an amazing woman. First of all, I love teachers anyway. It's a very important and underpaid <laughs> position. So how did, how did you make uh, the $150,000? You're amazing. <laughs> you're, you're the amazing one. So I entered a Capital One Facebook contest called Wish for Others. And I made a wish that my third grade adorable um, kids could have a book to take home with them over December break. And I ended up um, winning $150,000. Right. So you win. <laughs> what did you do with that money? I donated it back to my school. You gave all the money back to your school. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you're struggling to pay your own bills and you didn't keep a little bit of it. You gave it all to the school. No, my kids are just amazing. You know, 90% of our kids are low income. Um, some of them are homeless. They just have such challenges and adversity and they deserve so much. And this is just like a little bit of what I could give them. So then you have a kid in, in your class and he's looking out the window all the time and you say, what are you doing? He's looking at birds because bird. it makes him feel peaceful. So I went and got him a bird watching book for mm -hmm. kids um, and his grandmother called me and said that this was probably the only thing he'd get for Christmas. Um, 
So, so then you. <laughs> so my mom and I went to Target and made sure that he had, he and his sister had something to open because every kid deserves to open presents on Christmas. Yep, they do. <laughs> you are a saint. It feels good yeah. to be you. Well, like, it's, give it's, it away. it's, it's yeah, it feels good to help people. It really yeah. does. Here, I have a gift for you. If you love Skittles, <laughs> I don't know how long they stay fresh, but that, that is an aquarium full of Skittles. And in that Skittles, we also have, for you, $25,000. <laughs> <laughs> Mathematicians broke the Japanese codes and built the A-bomb. Mathematicians, like you. The stated goal of the Soviets is global communism. In medicine or economics, in technology or space, battle lines are being drawn. To triumph, we need results. Publishable, applicable results. Now, who among you will be the next Morse? the next Einstein. Who among you will be the vanguard of democracy, freedom, and discovery? Today, we bequeath America's future into your able hands. Welcome to Princeton, gentlemen. Nathan! Hiding in the back won't help you. Would you like to come up and show us? but as, uh, as numbers. We can call face down cards. One, face up cards, zero. And initially, it would be a sequence of ones, just the cards are all face down, but after a while it would look something like that. Um, as we can see, that is a binary number. And a move that consists of turning the face down card, face up, and the card immediately to the right of it. Could be that a one followed by a one would turn into a zero followed by a zero. That would be like that. Or it could be a one followed by a zero turning into a zero followed by a one. In either case, we can see that the the number in binary is strictly decreasing. And that means? Which means that the sequence must terminate. Because? Because you can't keep taking away from a positive integer without it turning negative. No. You can't. You definitely can't. Good work. Everyone? Good work.
He's the reigning Calgary Stampede champion. A week ago on Canadian soil, she would take home an event title the Minoka Stampede. Not only did she have a smoke and run yesterday, she tied the arena record, which we just broke this afternoon. This is the incredible horse that she calls sister that would take her to a world title. I want you to come alive for Haley Kinsel. Let's start a little energy flowing right now. Come on. Got a girl. Come on. I need a little help, fans. Come on, help me now. Come on. Now, one big cheer. One, two, three. She tied the arena record. 16. Number three in the world standings. This gray horse is one that has taught this 10-year-old quite a bit, but she rides him very well. us the fastest time of the season. The sparkles are shining bright in Salt Lake City. This young cowgirl has come to play the game the right way. To all the doubters out there, here it is. She's answering all of your questions. 10 years old and beating the best bow races in the world. No mistakes, week in, week out. That is a champion in the making.
this venue alone, we will push out in excess of 30,000 meals a day based on a full shift. I get up at 4.30 in the morning because everybody else is asleep. So that means my phone isn't going. I'm not getting disturbed. I have two hours to myself and that's where I get myself organized. The best career advice I've ever been given is from my father, John Ariaga Sr. And he told me, no matter what it is you're doing, always work harder than everybody else. Because if you have that fierce, fierce commitment to excellence in whatever you do, you will always be successful. How did he do it all? I've, I've always had an ethos with, uh, of just working at harder than anyone else that I admire and respect. No one man runs an operation like this. This is where we'll be serving breakfast from today for the dining room. I have three of the same kitchen here. Morning, are you lost? Yeah. What are you looking for? Right. Tell me what's missing off that kebab. Yeah, what's missing from it? Nothing, Nothing missing. All the ingredients are there. The, all, all the ingredients are there, but we got we're lacking one ingredient. What's the ingredient? A little red color. Alright, it's supposed to be much redder, yeah? yeah. Alright, like tandoori. Who made the sauce for the turkey? Yes, sir. Yeah? Did you yes. taste it? Yes sir. Really? Taste that, tell me what you taste. This is a bit too sharp there. Salty. Yeah? Extremely salty. Who made that vegetable stock for the broth? You made it. Tell me how you made your stock. We're constantly developing our chefs and constantly training them through our in-house training program. So it gives me a good indication of where we may have some people that we need to show a little bit more attention to. And can I see you write this down? Yes. Huh? I can teach anyone how to cook. That's the easy part. To teach someone to be dedicated and willing, that's got to come from within. We are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software. One person's in charge of Mac hardware. One person's in charge of iPhone hardware engineering. Another person's in charge of worldwide marketing. We all meet for three hours, once a week, and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business. And there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company, which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time, but trusting that they're gonna come through with their parts. And that's what we do really well.
Guys, I'm in a suburban neighborhood just a little north of Calgary and uh, today I want to show you how you can have a home-based business growing microgreens and you can scale it. These guys here, this operation is called Micro Acres and these guys are doing about $10,000 a month in revenue for their microgreen and it's two two people running it, husband and wife team working about 40 hours a week and they're doing those kind of numbers in their basement so we're gonna go check this basement out and uh, see what it's all about my name is David my name is Kristen. We live in Airdrie, Alberta, and this is our little microgreen farm, Micro Acres. We're again in Airdrie, Alberta, just a little bit north of Calgary. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting in about 400 square feet of germinating area uh, and grow area. We're running right now about 170 racks, give or take between both germinating off to your left here. And yeah, this is the main growing area here. So we have five fans running simultaneously 24-7. Uh, one of Kirst's favorites here, he just shows here, is our micro leak, mm -hmm. which is growing quite nicely right now. So these ones are running at about two weeks right now. We actually supply, uh, uh, University of Calgary actually takes quite a bit of our product as they developed a whole new program for bringing health nutrition to the students. So they did a big revamp last year mm -hmm. and added a bunch of food stations. So we do about nine different greens to them, one to be wheatgrass so they can do the juicing, radishes, broccoli, and they're adding that really cool culture of healthy um, you know microgreens to their products instead of having the typical cafeteria you know cafeteria food, food mm -hmm. pizzas the brown golden crust stuff right mm -hmm. so it's really nice to be able to work with them yeah. and work with their chefs and we're seeing that a lot in the Calgary region was it 40 hours a week that right you now we run about this? 40 hours a week outside of the you know the usual nighttime social media and Facebook and Instagram but that includes our delivery time our cutting time yeah. everything and that's everything. 40 hours yeah. cumulative between the two of us okay that's between not 40 hours two each. of you yeah Oh, that's even better. Yeah, yeah. That's so that's 40 hours <laughs> combined total between harvesting, cutting, deliveries. Uh, Tuesday is uh, bright and early. We're up by 3 a.m. and we do all our cutting. So we cut from 3 a.m. to about 6 a.m. Yeah. Uh, and we can cut about 90 trays in the time and that's including packaging. So the net, our daughters are both up at 6.30 so and we then we're basically free to Right. Be so to be parents. Exactly. So wow. an hour and a half for school, every like school, that. breakfast mm -hmm. for us to enjoy that family. There's got to be that balance of life. And that's what I've yeah. learned running restaurants. Mm -hmm. You know, you're running 18 hour days. Forget it. I no. don't mind running 18 hour days as long as there's like a purpose behind it. But this yeah. is in our own home. Our kids are down here. They're able to test product. So all those. 